Hi, welcome to this Open Security Summit session in February 2023. And we have a great panel here that is going to talk about finding and hiring security talent, which is something that everybody in the security industry uh, has been trying to. So uh, let's let's kickstart things. So I'm Dennis. I help to run the summit. I see so do a lot of other stuff, actively hiring. So if anybody wants to join a great team, you know, reach out. Um, why don't we go around? So Brian, Eliza, and Michael, why don't you guys just give a quick introduction yourselves and why this topic is very relevant to you? Should we say ladies first? Sure, I'll Eliza. Go, go on, sir. Brian. No, no, I'll, I'll agree. Oh, no, I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got some good start. Um, <laughs> I, I will go first. Um, so my name's Brian. I um, run our security engineering operations and architecture recruitment at LaFosse. Um, I was saying just before we started the panel, I've done this for 10 years now, and I think it's close to 400 security professionals I've probably helped hire in the last 10 years, which um, makes me feel old more than anything else. But um, yeah, something that I obviously clearly feel passionate about, I was able to stop doing this a long time ago. Okay, great. Um, thanks for that. Um, I'm Eliza May Austin and I run a company called That Security Company and uh, the subsidiary brand that you might recognise, which is called Pocket Seam. And so far, we've not had any problems hiring. And I'm Michael. Um, I work at New Day, um, who is a, a kind of like consumer lending credit card company. Uh, I look after the security architecture team, which includes application security, cloud security, and essentially trying to hire for the last couple of years and have there have been as well, varying degrees of success, uh, application security engineers, enterprise security architects, cloud security architects, you know, all, all of the easy things to find in the talent. Cool. So where should we start? So, you know, Clearly, we all we're all trying to hire. So why don't we just maybe go around and say what strategies that you use that actually help you to find talent? All right, wicked. So um, I'm lucky that I've got quite a large pool to pull from. Um, that's been through being on social media, being a, a gobshite on LinkedIn, and um, also that I used to run a non-profit called Ladies Hacking Society. I've got quite a lot of access to people as well. Um, when it's junior roles, I mean, we're a small company. There's like 15 of us. We are recruiting, but there's like there's only there's only 15 of us. We have hired multiple people, you know, let some go. So we've not had the right attitude. You know, we've done interviews and interviews and interviews for various different roles and not found the right person. So we've always got access to people, but not necessarily the right talent. So I guess that's what this conversation is about. Um, I find, um, you know, there's a handful of trusted recruiters that I'll use and also literally just putting something out on LinkedIn. If it's a more junior role, it might be that I'll reach out to my old university and see if they know of anyone that has recently graduated and looking for a role. Um, and also um, there's a local college for young adults, so 18 plus, I believe, um, in my area for people with um, neuro, that are neurodivergent. So we sometimes give them some work experience and if they're good, we'll keep them. So we just try and think outside the box where we can, to be honest. Especially, especially you've got the freedom to do that when it's junior roles, I guess. Yeah, that's uh, the, the, the number one compromise I always see from people. It's, oh, I want this much, but I'm only going to pay this much. And the gap is always been too big. And that's when you see roles open for six, 12, 18 months. Um, I think if you can hire the junior end and develop, yes, you're going to, you know, kiss some frogs, as you mentioned. But but ultimately, when you do get a good one, there'll be homegrown talent and you'll they're really malleable at that point, aren't they? So you, you get a really good hire out of it. Brian, what's your opinion on... Um, when you bring someone in, which has happened to us on a couple of occasions, not numerous times, on a couple of occasions, we've brought someone in that's been senior, you mm. know, paying them the big whack. They've got everything that looks right on LinkedIn and on their CV, and then they're just lazy as fuck. What's that? Yeah. Like? Look, at the end of the day, the, the, the trouble is people will try their luck to, to do anything in life, and getting a job is one of them. Um, so one thing I see is inflated things on CV. Um, and ultimately... 
I think people get greedy, want to land the big job. Um, you tend to see that a lot as well at the at the higher end, even you know, above senior engineering managers, heads of CISOs who, you know, the CISO title has become so coveted that you've got some heads of InfoSec who are like, yeah, I'm a CISO. I'm like, well, you're not a CISO, actually. What you are is a head of InfoSec, and you should be proud of that. Um, but then all they want to do is get for CISOs. You get the same with engineers. They spend two years engineering, and suddenly they're seniors. And it's actually, let's scale it back. What makes a senior engineer, and that is probably someone who's able to work on their own, work independently, your CV may have all the right tools, all the right software you know, bits on there, but can you work on your own and have you demonstrated that? And that's probably where you will find most people struggle. You're on me though, after two years, after two and a bit years. <laughs> no, I was just, I was just like agreeing with you. I just was muting myself because so Michael could jump in and I'd shut myself up. Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree on the, no, not kind of, I do agree on the the requirements and the gap from the salary and that I've seen a lot of organizations, they'll go, we want too many things. And I think when I, when I started working at New Day, going back, I think it's nearly three years now, inherited some job roles to hire. So like first task I had when I rocked up was, hey, you got to hire these roles. And I went through the job description. I was like, ah, this is going to be really tough because it kind of felt like we were asking for too much in in the role and part of it was kind of shaping it and being realistic about what you're expecting to find in the first place and really being clear on what are the things which are necessary versus what are the things which they're desirable and they're nice to have but to be honest like if we're too specific you're just basically cutting out too many people who essentially you want people who are smart who are capable of doing the job and just because they haven't had hands-on experience in one thing doesn't mean there aren't things that are transferable so the example with the roles that i inherited in the first place is there, there was this plan before because we've got like different cloud platforms to support um the, the strategy for hiring in the team that I inherited was, hey, we're going to have an AWS expert and we're going to have an Azure expert. And kind of my opinion is like, I, I don't really care if they're that specific. I just want somebody who understands it to do cloud security. And if they haven't, if they've come from a background on one and they don't understand the other, it's like, I, I don't mind. It, it's they can pick it up and they'll get familiar with the technology. And it's also that it's evolving so quickly anyway, that just because somebody three years ago knew AWS and how to secure it three years ago, okay, well, they're going to have to continue to evolve to understand how to secure it in the future as well anyway. So it's only ever a point in time. Yeah. Um, so it's just, you know, moving more towards adapting the open roles and the job requirements to, that we have around. We keep searching for these unicorns that have all of the things. We're going to have roles, which as Brian said, are open for like 12 months, 18 months and and adapting our requirements to, we need to pick what we can get from the talent pool and the talent pool is the talent pool and we can kind of keep having a wish list but it, it's you need to kind of see what's out there and go well based on the skills that we're seeing this is reasonably what we can get and and perhaps actually we need to reshape the job roles to fit what's available um otherwise it's a role which is just going to stay empty and is going to kill us when we're trying to deliver stuff and support teams and like having nobody is much worse than having somebody who is talented capable smart and you can develop to do the role properly yeah i think dennis is froze has anyone else got that uh, I, I, I do yeah uh, if, if i can just kind of interject um i'm not in the in the area of, of hiring people but coming from the other other end uh, of things um i i see that i've seen this a few times where you've got people I, I think the key thing is soft skills, right? Okay. Like you said, do they have the ability to, to take the lead? Can they show initiative? Can they communicate? You know, those kind of things are very important. And, and technical skills as a foundation should be there. But half the time, you end up learning a lot of the stuff on the job. You get thrown into it. And yeah. it's like, right, so I, I need to do this. Okay, well, if I don't know how to do it, I'm going to have to go on and, and sort it out. Whereas too many times I've seen people, they've got 101 certifications, but they're paper techs, right? Yeah. They've got everything on paper, but you give them the simplest task and it's just like they freeze, you know, and it's like, oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And, uh, you know, I'd rather have someone who doesn't have the, the technical experience that I can train up quite quickly because mm. the, 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 you know, desire to, to do, and motivation to do things rather than have someone who's very technical, but like you said, doesn't actually have any motivation in the job. 
The question like, is how do how do we measure that, right? So I, I think clearly we we you know cybersecurity at the moment is is caused a problem, which is you know it's it's a good and a bad problem. I, I think clearly there's a massive shortage of a certain type of talent, and I think it's, I don't think it's just here. I think it's also feed by you know hiring really good developers is very hard today, right? You know it's also very expensive hiring good cloud engineers. You know there's a segment of technology that kind of on the the forefront of what's good is very expensive. And I, I would actually argue that we get to the point of diminishing returns. We get to the point where, like, in a way, you know, I, I think, Brian, you were saying this, you know, some, some individuals are asking for it. And look, you know, at the end of the day, if the market is supporting some of those behaviors, you're going to see that, right? You're going to see individuals that can play the market very well and individuals that can ride the market really well, right? That's, that's the, and the, and the fact that we're now having to pay you know, quite a lot for, you know, probably what, what would be a candidate that we don't think has the right level of skills. I think what I think the solution is that we need to look outside of security, right? Absolutely. I, I, I don't think we have a security, a cyber security shortage problem. I think we have a cyber, cyber security transfer problem. I don't think we have good formulas. And my question to you is kind of like, well, we're actively trying to do this. And I actually try to write, even write rules where I said cyber security is not a, you know, a requirement here, right? Or at least you can learn on the job, right? I think what's now interesting is then how do you measure those non-security skills, right? Those other skills that they have in other parts of other industries that they can then apply to cybersecurity. So how do you measure that? Like how do you measure, you know, that person when they give an opportunity, which is probably much more senior from a point of view of the role that you want, uh, they're just not seen in cybersecurity. But they are more senior in their experience on managing people, managing structure, or even technical stuff, right? How do you manage that? How do you help to make that transition? I, I don't think you can manage it. I don't think you can measure it, sorry, like in a very logical sense, in my opinion, because we are dealing with human beings. But I do think that, you know, if you're a business that is, you know, you, you're wanting to recruit someone senior for your security team, and you are sort of cloud dependent. So you use GCP, right? Rather than going and trying to find a security specialist or a security specialist with GCP experience, why not just hire a cloud a cloud engineer like or, or a network engineer with cloud experience? Mm -hmm. So they're going to be eager to learn because it's a new challenge. And they're already, they've already proven themselves through their career to be capable mm -hmm. to understand the underlying foundation. So there's a, a lot of people that make the mistake that I made, actually, is I went straight into a degree with digital forensics without really understanding the core components of like how, you know, file systems and Slack space and all this shit interacts with each other and what actually happens like. When, you know, I didn't really understand the core concepts of computing. And I went and I was like, I can do this. This will be a piece of piss. And then I went and drove straight, dove straight into a digital forensics degree and I had my mind blown. I did it fine. Um, but then I spent my working career and while I was studying, learning those foundations around network engineering and, you know, around just, you know, more stuff that's like more primitive stuff that I should have already known before I took that degree on so mm -hmm. if you have someone that comes to you depending on what you need with a network engineering background that you can apply to cloud security fantastic if your main components is that you are an e-commerce company and you want to protect your your website your EMS system then maybe getting a developer which really understands how those things hang together is someone that you can go and groom into a security role so you they're thirsty for it and they're capable and that's the only way i see that you can you can actually measure their capability to walk into a role like that at a senior level but what, what is this described there are already measurable things right like if i reverse engineer your your path there you know you see passion you see you know putting yourself in a place where you you know you're out of your death but then learning the technical elements so don't you know, like don't have, you know, like you didn't shy away from the challenge of going, I want to understand the foundations of what we are doing, right? Yeah. And that's measurable, right? Because that's the story, right? Mm -hmm. So um the, the the thing that I I'm I, I feel one one of the sweet spots that I I kind of have found a bit is try to measure the passion into cybersecurity. 
Because the, the other thing that's interesting is what I found is I found that there's also, if you open the door, right, to say, hey, I'm open to, to interview, to hire people outside of cybersecurity, right? So we had some great applicants, right? Like literally from, you know, really interesting careers, right? From, from the defense to, to the healthcare, to the retail, right? Applying for senior cybersecurity roles, right? But the, the thing that I found that was probably the, the one I want to measure more is I want to measure how much they almost are already on the journey to become a cybersecurity professional. Right, it, which is which is basically is that idea that if you have an opportunity to jump industry, surely you should be geeking out on everything on that career. In fact, you should be going on a path of of almost going and say, well, you guys in cybersecurity love to invent stuff, right? Because what you called you know a sock is what we call over here this, and what you guys called you know you 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 think this is so so amazing but guess what i came from the airline industry and we have fucking this 10 times right so every other industry actually is more mature than cybersecurity right? <laughs> especially technology right like you 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 come from those industries i'm trying to figure out a nice way to measure that excitement right which is basically the excitement that you give to somebody to say i'm going to take a bet on you what can i already see so that i don't have to wait until we hire the person to actually see how they perform so how can you measure excitement in cybersecurity by somebody who's not a cybersecurity expert today? Uh, well, Doing the interview process, right? Just to throw in something there, I once read someplace, uh, I think it was on LinkedIn, where someone had said, cybersecurity is not a profession, it's a lifestyle. So you, you know, it, you, you basically it's on your mind even when you're not really working or it, it just becomes a part of who you are. You know, you're always looking at, at things in one way or another that that is within line with your profession. So I think that's one of the things you're, you're trying to find, isn't it? It's trying to see how passionate this person is, how much do, are they willing to learn? How much do they want to do? But like you said, Dennis, how do you actually, you know, what's the metrics for that? How do you, how do you measure that? I think you avoid the, the interview trap, right? Sorry, go on, Alison. No, I was going to say, I think if you go down that route, you are, um, sort of we've got like this issue where we're saying we need talent and, and then we're saying and we need people we need bums on seats in a lot of cases and then we're saying we want people that are able to externally evidence their passion so in a sense what we're doing is saying we either want extroverts that are always writing blog posts on linkedin doing podcasts and all that shit and exhibiting their passion that way or we're saying people that live and breathe it, therefore we're excluding people that are happy to make it a career out of necessity and interest rather than passion, which is equally as important. So I have someone fantastic, absolutely is absolutely brilliant and he's super reliable, but at five o'clock he fucking clocks off and he goes to the pub every single day, five o'clock. And there is, you know, it would be pointless to try and get him to stay in late because five o'clock I'm going, he starts at nine, he finishes at five and that's it. But he's phenomenal. He's not passionate about it. It's an end. It's a means to an end to him. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, and it even goes all the way back to university. You get people who go to university, they'll do a computer science degree because they did maths at school, and they thought, okay, that's the next logical step, and they just become mercenaries. And look, it, for me personally, I don't leave work and stuff and go right. I only think about recruitment all weekend. Look, I, I'm passionate about my job in my job hours. It doesn't make me any better or any any worse. But we have this stigma and security that unless you've got your own github unless you've got your own uh you know hack the box account and you're constantly thinking about security you're not good enough um and that's that's the biggest issue i see aside from certs and everything else which you know ultimately, ultimately is multiple choice like exams so i could literally tomorrow take my seat and there's a, there's a chance i could pass just by guessing so yeah, chat gpt can pass the system as well you could pass all the all the exactly filters. So um, I completely agree with Eliza said, um, we need to get so far away from this has to be a passion because otherwise we will always have the shortage because people have families, people have hobbies, believe it or not, uh, in security. So the, the the more you draw that message of, I want you to be cyber 24 seven. No, but I, I, that's not, okay. So I, that's not what I was trying to say, right? I, I actually believe in a work-life balance, right? You know, sometimes I have it, sometimes I don't have it, but I actually think that, the individuals, and I, I think Eliza, you, you spot on that we need to cater for everything, right? For from the introvert to extrovert, you know. And again, I, 
our, our work with we a work from home mom in the middle of Wales that again, we do that. And she were, she became one of the best incident responders that I ever had, right? And, and she actually never done security before, but she was so good at, at, at analytics and following things and connected dots, et cetera, that she became a great incident responder. But, but I'm not saying that what I'm trying to measure is the, the crazy, you know, that end of the spectrum. What I'm basically saying is that if, if somebody's moving to another career, right? There's things that we should be able to measure to help to give those opportunities. Because the problem is if we don't have a pragmatic way to bring the talent in, it becomes also very hard, right? Because uh, you know, it, it's almost like at least in security or in technology, you have some basis, right? Like I, I literally tried this, right? And, and it was quite interesting that you know, the, the more away you go from technology, right? Somebody who wants to jump into technology or jump into security, right? You are looking at other things. But I, I do feel that there's a degree of, of, of curiosity, right? Maybe not passion, but there's a degree of curiosity because you're going to go into that field and your learning curve has to go like this. Okay, let's be clear. Like, unless you want to hire somebody that, you know, is already doing a very mechanical job or very, very described, you know, like Michael, the way you're talking about, you know, I want to grab somebody, a developer who now wants to be a cloud specialist, right? Mm. Absolutely the right thing to do. But those individuals have to become passionate, or at least very motivated to learn about cloud, right? Because or, or else, you know, you, you end up with a developer. Right? And what you yeah. don't want to develop, you want a cloud specialist. And you're saying, I believe a, a, a developer can get a cloud specialist, but they have to geek out on it. Maybe they only geek out from nine to five. That's not the point. The point mm -hmm. is they have to become experts and excited and get into the, the frame of security, which is actually a really cool, exciting place, right, to be. So if I take that and go back to, um, I go back to 2016. So I started working in security in 2016. Previously to that, I was just what you might call like a tech, right? Yeah. I did uh, like cloud solutions, worked for different MSPs. And the reason that I moved into security or kind of pivoted into it was because I was bringing cloud, I basically like was responsible for doing like high level designs for cloud solutions, et cetera. And then one of the, the steps of that is I would need to bring it to the security team for them to review it. And like in my case, what they were like, were like, hey, we like working with you because every time we, you bring something to us, we don't really need to fix the security because you sort of did it properly the first time. Um, and then the CISO of the organization um, said was, hey, you want to come work in the security team? And I guess what we're talking about, if somebody's passionate or are they passionate about security and like if somebody had asked me at that time like are you passionate about security i was like i don't know because i was like still needing to be sort of convinced and and part of it is trying to it had to be sold to me and and i feel like i would have to sell it to other people and i do try and sell it to people in the organization as well where i am at the moment and like going hey come you know i can see that they're doing the right things and they're passionate about doing things correctly it's like I'm passionate about doing their job right in the first place and i think yeah. that's kind of like part of the reason why i was you know, when I would bring things to them, they would be fully formed because they could see that, hey, you want to do things the right way. Cool. Come in and do it. And I think kind of more generically or broadly, I was passionate about doing things correctly rather than necessarily caring. Was it security? Or was it other things? It's like, am I building something which is uh, yeah. resilient and will have, you know, meet its SLA targets and other things? And like security was an element of that. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, I, I, I guess, yeah, I would say like anybody who's just interested in doing their job properly or doing their job right in the first place if we're just you know that example of taking somebody who they work in tech and it's like okay well can you focus like focus on securing that tech so like i speak to business analysts and solution architects and developers and there's a few of them have expressed like a maybe interest in in doing it so i'm still working on them um but that's kind of like my background and story and i kind of see how my my i suppose goal or wish is to try try and find somebody else to kind of convince them to to come over and come into it as well. Now, look, you, you are actually a perfect example because, you know, you already are passionate about security, right? The fact that you, you know, you didn't see it at the time, right? But if you look at the signals, you already, you know, the typical, you know, I would say success story on the making because you're already a developer or an engineer that was already thinking about security. And you thought about security, not because you woke up one morning and go, oh, maybe it is, because you researched mm -hmm. right? You, you took it, you probably found it interesting. You found some exploits and go, wow, that's quite cool, right? Now, you might not at the time click that you can make a career out of it, but 
you already had a passion there. You already had an interest. Maybe passion, let's not worse the word passion, because I think passion is very aligned with the extrovert. You had an interest. You had an attention to detail that is measurable. And I, and I think that's what we need to find if you're going to open up the talent pool to bring in to, to the security space, right? And to allow people to jump and become fully fledged security professionals, which is great for their career. But it's, you know, it's, again, it's no bed of, bed of roses, right? Like it's, you have to work hard, right? Again, nine to five, that's fine. But you have to spend a considerable amount of resources and effort in learning your craft because you are going into a new world. How, how do you think, um, so probably along from when you found somebody or you've hired somebody in, have you seen examples of where you've got somebody in, they've tried it and, you know, for whatever reason it didn't work out or the support yeah. that we need to offer there. So I've got like one of the, the my friends, uh, she went to join a, a cloud security team and speaking to her a couple of months later, she was, you know, maybe feeling a bit of imposter syndrome because she moved over into security. And I think from speaking to her, like my personal advice at that time was like, and, and it's kind of more goes from the knowledge, the technical knowledge, separating knowledge from actions and behaviors and, and skills to go like, right, find what you can do that this team can't do. Look at where this team is weak and what you add to it and bring to it. And then the knowledge will come later. Like you can learn all of that stuff, but yeah. find what you can do and make a niche for yourself within the team. Because the, there's also like a lot of the people who traditionally, and you know, even in my teams, um, a lot of the skills and capabilities are the same. Um, but again, like Puni, to your point, the soft skills can be missing if we've all kind of come through the same type of track and pathway into security in the first place and trying to find somebody from outside who brings something else to the table that, that you know, kind of organization, project management, going out and meeting with stakeholders, yeah. those are things where it's like, I'd really like, like, how do I add those soft skills to the team? Like in some yeah. case, you can find somebody with those skills, add the knowledge in, round out the team better and make it more diverse. So my, my strategy, and, and Puni is a good example because he's on a success side of the strategy, right? Is that uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of maybe, you know, simple way, it's about, you know, giving the, uh, you know, throwing the, the person to a massive challenge, right? And then see what happens, right? And, and be very open about it, right? But also um, make it easy to experiment like that. Right. So I, I, I and actually it tend to to be honest, it tends to work really well. It, it tends not to work very well. Right. And and but I, I take the view that I'm giving somebody a great opportunity and it's almost up to them, right? To 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 take it to the next level, right? Because you know, and, and by the way, this this is not for the kind of work that is very defined, right? I think that's different. We're not know what we're talking about. We talk about the kind of work you just described, where you need people to, you know, come in, think, rationalize, understand. You're going to get given too much stuff, too much information. You know, find find the sweet spot for you, right? Mm. That is sweet, right? So I, I look, I tend to view it as a bit Darwinian, right? Like you, 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 you find the talent, you give them the opportunity, right? In probably ways that you know, and others wouldn't, because you know, you can be more more open about it. And then you know, I, I kind of have this mental picture. It's a bit like having this gigantic freaking chaos it's all red everything is fucking shit show you, you, you look at it going oh my god i'm in a fucking mess right you drop this person in the middle and then you know eventually it goes a bit green a bit yellow and then it's a bit more and then every time you look it's kind of good and okay and then you get good questions and eventually it goes green and everybody's having a nice party in the middle and you know having food put together right like that's what it looks like from the distance right like but the other crowd that doesn't work right is they 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 get lost they go what am i supposed to do you know wh where's my direction it's like what do you want me to do i'm like the point here is to find that sweet spot, right? You know, there's enough area here for you to find a little spot for you to actually get on with it and start doing something good. I right? think that's harsh as fuck. <laughs> I'm so harsh. <laughs> it's fair like, because you actually, I, I, the thing about this is that, yes, a little bit, but the right talent thrives and the right talent learns a lot and the right talent gets an evolution in their career like that. So depends I can point to what, sorry? It depends, it really depends on the role. So for example, yeah. we've got somebody like he's not on LinkedIn, is you know, he's got like social issues, doesn't want to engage, absolutely fine. Um, and is you know, never gonna be never is not never gonna be career orientated. Like he's looking at it because it's interesting to him because of the way his mind works and he knows how to piece things together. He's, you know, he's on board with doing that job. 
doesn't want to be you know a, um, a head engineer doesn't want to be a, a team lead doesn't want to be a CFO ne- never going to happen he's interested in just doing this one thing and he just like give him another thing to do leave me alone I can't cope so sometimes you need some people in a team to have like a team that's like lacking in egos which you can only have so many egos you need some Indians you need some chiefs right um sometimes you need some people that aren't going to thrive in those situations that are going to follow orders in those situations because you might have someone in an incident like what we're talking about yesterday that is the one that's saying i need this 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 and this and they tell the people that they they expect to get that information from and those people know that they've got that job to do they've got to do that and they've got to hand that over and that's mm-hmm. it they can move on to something else and those people they aren't the most engaged they aren't the most um career driven and they're definitely not the most passionate and they are the kinds of people that if you throw them into a whirlwind they're going to have a panic attack and they're probably going to quit the industry so i think it's a balance if you need someone yeah. say you need someone to lead an incident absolutely dennis i would i would create a fake incident and throw it at them and if they even took a moment to breathe i'd be like get out of here but do you know what i mean like it just really depends on the role i agree, and by the way, I, I agree with having a balanced team by the way right i you cannot have all all people crazy but but I think if you look at from a recruitment point of view, it's easier to hire the ones you talked about because you you write a very tight job spec, you write a very tight description, and they exist, right? Like that's not where we have the recruitment challenge, right? Like those individuals are easier to hire, right? Because they are the job spec is tight, the definition of what they want to do is tight, right? And then you you know you hire those individuals that do that one thing really well, and and yes, you need sometimes individual in the organization that can do a couple of things really, really well. Great. But those are easier to hire. In terms of like measuring based on previous roles, say if you're like an IT lead, in IT, right, or an engineer or whatever, network engineer, for example, and it's not in your job title to do security, but you're at a company that there isn't a security team, so you just kind of fucking do it anyway. Awesome, right? You go... And you go for an interview at a security company, well, like mine, we're going to be interested in you. Way more so than someone that's come through, you know, with a degree and got some certifications like Brian was saying earlier. So I think like just going back to what you were saying before, that's a really good way of measuring it. If someone's just got a genuine interest or they've been doing it anyway and they've not really like about it on social media, that's awesome. Yeah. I had an experience uh, four years ago where the IT manager for the company for the time said to me, Brian, look, I'm an IT manager at a recruiting company of 100 people. I love the thought of doing security, but I just I can't do it. You know, I said, well, look, what have we done here so far? He's all right, we've stored firewalls, I've done this, I've done that. So look, humor me. Let me introduce to a client of mine and see what they think of that. And he got hired. Yeah. Got the, the, the interviewer said, look, this guy actually has had a way better interview than for a stock analyst role. So nothing he'd done before. So look, the way he thought about answers, the way he thought about how he yeah. could do things, that I've interviewed other stock analysts who do the job, he would get him paid to do the job, yeah. and this guy trounced them. And then, but how yeah. do you create that market? How do you convince those individuals they should be applying for security roles? Because what happened there is, in, and I think probably all of us have similar experiences, the, wrong, the right conversation at the right time and the right nudge allowed one more person to join. The, you approach the them. Yeah, you, but, you have to reach out. Yeah, we, we do that, right? You know, and I think there's a there's there's a lot of cases where I'm sure most of us have found individuals that we nurtured and we we promoted and we pushed and we say, hey, you should apply exactly that kind of stuff. Like, hey, you're already doing security, right? You you have imposter syndrome. I mean, you you're better security engineer than you know. I, I've seen a lot of developers and and the ops and sec, and and ops people being better security engineers than the security engineers, right? Because they actually do it a lot more. You know, even all sorts of security things, right? But how how do we open up the market, right? How do we keep, you know, that that talent pool to now start going for security roles? I, from my insight as a recruiter, I speak to CISOs 20, 30 a week and all of these things. It's actually walking the walk of saying, oh, yeah, of course I'll have a look at those people. Actually then doing it and saying, I'm going to hire those people. That's the biggest challenge. Um, you know, not not to do a shameless plug, but this company here that you see, the academy side, we train developers, right? They do 13 weeks. It's no different from a learning perspective than FDM, code makers. There's a ton out there. Yeah. We are doing differently right now, which between you know, if you and our team we saw, actually, they could do security. Why couldn't they? They've learned to develop in 13 weeks. 
they could learn surely the next step in security in the next eight weeks. So we've just introduced an eight-week model where a client would go, look, for example, pick a cloud provider, GCP. We're hosting GCP and I need a junior GCP security engineer. And they learn GCP in eight weeks or the, the basics. Yeah. And they learn the basics of container security and then they'll, ha- then they'll have them join. That's 22 weeks of learning and they've suddenly got a problem solved that would have taken months to solve because GCP security is quite hard to find. Yeah. Um, and that's where, again, the, the challenge still is the company. We've got 18 students a month who are graduating who could do security, but hiring managers are still not taking the risk of saying, look, I'll take you on. That's the biggest blocker, I would say, right now. Yeah. So how do we fix that? I don't know. Well, I, I think it's, you're right. Part of it is on the hiring, right? But but I and I think is 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 on on just you know you know creating that that demand right and and helping those individuals to transition from one industry to another and I, you know I think what you guys are doing is great right I think he, in some cases where it works is phenomenal right it's it's pretty yeah. cool because you're bringing you basically bringing new people right you're giving people a career path right to go into cybersecurity right and you kind mm-hmm. of measure in a way you you you're already self selecting the passion a little bit because or the focus because the people that already go to those programs tend to already have a bit of a a desire and a focus on wanting to do that. Yeah, and they're super clever. I've had a few chats with them, and honestly, and some of them are ex electricians, some of them are ex. Yeah. One of them, one of them was trying to be an astronaut. The, the 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 diversity of the people that are coming through is absolutely yeah. bonkers. But they all have one thing in common: they're all very very clever at producing, you know. Well, applications, content code, whatever it is they're doing, they're all absolutely automatic because they are all ultimately bright people, not bright, smart yeah. people. I think one of the, the issues actually is, is not only about pulling people in, but it's the fact that, you know, for a lot of people, cybersecurity, it's some sort of black art. And, you know, oh, I don't have the skill set. If I'm not a pen tester, I don't have the skill sets to be in cybersecurity because that's all they see in in cinemas movies and and shows you know everyone has to be mr robot and and if you're not mr robot though guess what you know i I can't be working in cybersecurity people will laugh at me and and, and, we we all hack our ways into it man i I remember having the hacking exposed book and going right let's try this out right and you know and be asked can you test this ago of course i can absolutely But you know, the thing is, in cybersecurity, it's it's a really big field. It's like saying, uh, you know, you, for being a doctor, well, you could be a brain specialist, you can be a foot specialist, you can be a general GP. So in the same way, I don't think there's enough done or there's not enough awareness that, you know, you don't have to be a specialist in, in pen testing to be able to become, you know, in cybersecurity, or you don't have to be a, a you know, uh, an AppSec uh you know uh developer or something that that otherwise you're not going to get a job in it yeah can i just say um we recently started hiring for um well recruiting for a um like a a really senior position um to act act as like a senior technologist not like just senior wearing a suit and pushing a pencil around that's not what i meant like a a senior technologist role and instead of like putting an ad out there for like head of security deployment implementation whatever and we didn't even mention security I put out a post on LinkedIn and one on Twitter that was like we are looking at someone that's got plenty of experience as a sysadmin network engineer or has spent a long time in IT a senior in IT and we were inundated with applications absolutely inundated we interviewed you know back to back over the weekend and the caliber of people that we got was insane it was incredibly hard to narrow it down and that was because I think because we didn't mention security then when they got in the interview we said actually it is security but we want you to bring your you know experience as a sysadmin to the table and we want to work with that and we can bolt on the security that you need 
And I mean, we found some people that were just like chef's kiss, really happy with, and we're going to make an offer this week. So, and it's been super quick turnaround, but we've not mentioned security. And I think that goes to actually what Puneet was saying. Like, if you want a shoeopardist, you advertise for the shoeopardist, you don't advertise for a, a, med, a medical person. Although you say I'm brutal. Imagine they arrive first day going, okay, so I'm working here. Whoa, what? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? No, it wasn't. No, well, it was welcome. <laughs> welcome. In the interview, to... <laughs> we were like, actually, it's this, but yeah. And they, some of them were like, oh, cool. And then others, they kind of got it because we're a security company. Like, it's literally our name. Um, but yeah, I, I thought it was like a really cool way of doing it because we got yeah. so, the caliber was awesome. I think that's the way to do it. Like, to be honest, I think that's exactly the way to do it, especially now that there's such a, um, uh, a premium on security, you know, skills, right? That, you know, it's, it's, it's I almost see like you, you want to hire somebody at this level, but you're almost having to pay, you know, hiring somebody which is literally at this level to, and pay this amount because that's the market. <laughs> My thinking is why don't you hire somebody at that level that wants to come into security, right? And the, and the irony here is that we, or have a premium in our roles, right? Like the reality is that you go outside security and what we pay, right, for some of the roles we have are insane, right? Like, you know, you, you, got, you have, you know, insane professionals doing insane things, super qualified engineers, you know, amazing managers, amazing talent people, people, crazy things, people, great project managers, which I guarantee most of them could be amazing security professionals and they get paid half of what a security uh, professional does. Just because we have a premium now and it won't last for a long time but you know so far there's still a massive premium on security skills right and that's, i'm of, trying to figure out how to get that talent in right how to bring those guys in girls there's a common denominator with all of that with everyone what you've all said is that you all know what you work in really quite well so you could tell someone have someone jo junior join you and you could teach them the ropes you could say to them, no, this is how you do it this is how you can, you can learn mm -hmm. i wonder how many hiring managers out there are hiring roles which they have no idea what it entails therefore their default is let's pay someone senior a lot of money and it's not my problem anymore and that's also a big challenge where you've got a, a list of 200 seasons in the uk who are very grc focused and go i need someone to do software security i don't know what it looks like i don't know how to get it but if i pay 150 surely that'll get me someone to do it and then you've got all these senior engineers who are now heads off security engineering or you know, whatever it might be. And that's also an issue that they're not trained. So they just pay because you can't get fired if you pay loads of money. because you've, you know, you've entrusted somebody else to do it. Well, they should be hiring a recruitment agency to do that. Right. I think to be honest, I think, Look, if it was uh, down to me, I would, uh, I would happily teach everyone. Uh, I, I, I think it's now you're talking about, that's exactly the scenario that you want to go for a recruitment agency, right? It's like, you know, imagine if I had to hire, a specialist in I don't know geospace you know aerospace engineering right for, for whatever reason right I would go to just go, hey on that field right because hey you guys understand that right mm. yeah but that's again we come up against that a lot um yeah. not 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 taking punts and junior people and then paying for somebody who's maybe not even that skilled yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that definitely exists so what, a couple of final questions so what what's your experience on reducing the need to, to sift through a bazillion of CVs, right? And allowing, you know, almost like the interview process, the, the talent to already shine, you know, in, in that process. So my, my, my trick is to get them to do a presentation, which works really, really well. I, I think this goes back to, though, Dennis, about- It works really well, Eliza. It, it goes back to what can you do for us as opposed to what can we do for you? And that's, again, the security stigma. We're already presenting a blocker I'm, I, I, all I'm asking them is the candidates to is to present themselves better, right? So I'm not saying here's a problem I got, let me get you work for free, right? In fact, you know, I actually will publish videos. You know, if you see some of the stuff I hire, right? like I, we would do the legwork too, right? You know, I would present them our security strategy, all the jazz. What I'm saying is that, you know, see, I don't think CV is a great way to present individuals. In fact, mm -hmm. my my usually my first interview is picking their CV apart and saying. You know what you just said is amazing but it's not on your cv right so usually it's about getting their passions out getting what they care about you know having a much better way to explain who they are as individuals versus a cv which is a massive shopping list of stuff that you might have done or might be involved in it 
Yeah. I saw a really good question today. Someone posted online somewhere. And it was, tell me about a time that you thought about packing your job in. And now tell me why you didn't. And that tell me why you didn't bit. And this person had interviewed hundreds of people and the tell me why you didn't quit your job turns out is the real answer as to why someone does something. Because at some point we've all thought, all right, fuck this, I'm leaving my job. But then we have gone, actually, no, I'm, g- I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay. Um, and, it, and it might be actually that you just think it's the money, but there'll be something there that drives you. And finding that driver is why people will come to work for you and be successful. Yeah. But, but look, let, let me quickly show you guys this, right? Because I think this is such a good example of it. Can you guys see my screen? I've got a slide share these days if you complain, but uh, can you guys see my screen? The yeah. Yeah. Yep. Map? Right. So this is, so by the way, this is not the, 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 final, the first version. In fact, I actually use the interview process as a way to, you know, I, I, I end up hiring Nick, right? So again, I, and, I, and I ask him to publish this, right? So it's, I put the link in there. But I, I also use his evolution of this presentation as a way to see, you know, his skills and, and how he communicates, how he learns. But also, I use this to brief the people that would meet him as part of the interview process. So, so if, for example, here, this is great, right? Like just this, I get more about him than I would get out of a CV, right? He's, he's a cyclist, right? He works competitive, you know, he's, he's swam probably competitive. Like this already is a great way, great opener, right? To have somebody. And when you talk about him, he will talk about that he did elite sport, right? And then he went to the MOD and then he professional services and then publishing, right? So you could see, this is actually one of the best ones I've seen in terms of giving me one page that shows his career, right? And, and you know, we worked on this, we improved a little bit, you know, some of the things were, you know, you could see like where he learned, where, you know, so this is a, for example, a great little micro view of somebody and their evolution in their career, right? And their ability to communicate, for example, to stakeholder management. So, uh, and again, like, you know, you, you could see then the cyber, the business element to it, the way he thinks about these things. Um, then you, you got, you know, uh, come on. But that kind of like senior stakeholder role, yeah. great idea, absolutely great idea. But if yeah. I if I think back to like when I was younger, if someone had been like, in fact, some of them were, we want a presentation or we want you to do like a video yeah. of yourself. I was like, fuck that. I don't want to work there. Like it, it put me off. So you're probably going to get a great deal of candidates, but they're going to be very similar in their approach. Not really. I don't have to say, no, not really. We are... The, the only commonality, I think, was a desire to present themselves better. Because all I'm asking is saying, you already spent time creating a CV, right? Like, that's already you, right? Like, you, 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 you haven't sent a, a post-it note with saying, I want a job, right? So, <laughs> you know, like, you, people already work on a CV. What I'm saying is that CVs are a horrible way to make decisions. And so if you send a CV, you're forcing the other company that has now... 50 or 100 or whatever that number CVs or 30, whatever, to make a decision. So, so this is a way to all say, look, we care about this. Can you present yourselves? You know, in fact, I even got to the point where I would say, look, just make a presentation or a video or something about uh, something you, you're passionate about, right? So some of, in fact, some of the more junior members, they, they, one guy did a great thing about he loves cars, right? Cool. But what I want to see is that interest. I want to see that attention to detail. I want to see that extra thing that the person has, right? Which is which doesn't come out on a CV, and I think makes it more fair because all I'm asking is give a give a, a presentation or give me something that is you that show me your values, your 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 ethics, your how you approach things, right? And um, you know, and the, again, depending on the role, you then can be very excited or not as excited, but it's still <laughs> fairer than a CV. I just remembered about um, this is. I swear this is relevant, but it's a stupid story. When I was, um, I think I was 16, I went for a job at Thompson and it was like some holiday, like um, where you meet people off of the bus and like get them to their accommodation type thing in, in a different country. And they did this and they were like, we want you to do a presentation on something that's interesting. And I totally misread the brief. So I turned up to this like auditorium and then people were there talking about like their favorite hair grip or the magazine that they liked or like their favorite tv show and I got on stage and spent 20 minutes talking about bum cancer (laughs) 
because at that time I was like I don't know what what's interesting to talk about or what's really impacting the world right now and then there was like something on loose women about like men getting diagnosed with bum cancer and I was like I know I'll talk about bum cancer <laughs> so I went and got on stage and spoke about bum cancer for 20 minutes and everyone was just like and they obviously did not offer me the job because they were like she's bizarre <laughs> <laughs> At a 16 year old Eliza thinking about men's bums. <laughs> yeah, the, the fact the interesting thing is the fact that you, you did that. I, I actually think that that's interesting, right? In fact, the fact they were to ad lib, right? It's it's sometimes it's no, like, I didn't ad lib. I prepared a presentation about prostate cancer. There you go. Well, I, there you go. Attention to detail. Right? I actually Research had a clicker it. and everything. It was, yeah, yeah. Right, cool. I'll stop talking. Fa fa final thoughts on, on this topic. Be more open, I think. And then how we'll be happier. Industry? Okay, quick advice. How to get into our industry, right? Because I still feel that we need we need more talent to join in. How 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 to get into the industry? Okay. Um be willing to start at the bottom. So or start midway through. So if you are, you know really high up in you know as a primary school teacher and you're doing really well good for you if you then think I am earning 40,000 pounds uh, as a primary school teacher and I want to be in cyber security because that's where the money is don't expect to go for a junior entry-level role earning the big bucks right or just don't do it I, I know like that that's the debatable topic in and of itself but I find that a lot no, no, I, I, I agree, right? Where, well, I, I think sometimes, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like you have to sometimes, if you're going to jump careers, right? You sometimes have to go and do things. It's always like find the thing that you're really good at and jump in there, right? And that might be not the most sexy or the most interesting, the most highly paid, but that allows your foot in industry and then you can yes. almost social engineer your way. Yeah, I, I would agree. Like, you know, the industry is so big now that anybody who's good at something can find an area of cybersecurity that they should be good at, right? I would imagine it's short-term pain, isn't it? You, you got to think, oh, well, maybe for the next two years, yeah. three years, I'm going to have to slog it out at a, you know, let making less than what I'm making now. But you know, hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to progress and 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 surpass what I, I'd be making if I'd stayed in my current role. Yeah. But not to get too political about it, but, you know, is now the right time for someone to do that? You know, given how things are in the wider world, is it now the time to say to people, you know, you should be earning less to, to go more? I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it's not the right answer, but there, need, there needs to be a way for a, a smoother transition from any other industry um, without having to halve your salary and what I don't know, do something. If they genuinely are transferable skills, let's make the most of those. Well, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say to myself, right, I'm going to go and be a doctor. I'm going to retrain. I'm going to go and be a doctor. I want brain surgeon salary. I won't do it. I'd go and be a junior doctor. Mm. Yeah. But we, we, the, the thing about cybersecurity, right, it's, it's again, it's, I, I still think it's one of those industries that you can still hack your way into it because there's such a, a, a massive growth. A lot of other industries have matured to the point where you, you, you can't just you know, turn up, right? <laughs> it's like, even to be a junior doctor, you can't just freaking turn up. Like junior doctors, you know, they 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 miss call junior doctors. I think they, they come out of like five years of heavy training, right? In freaking medical school. And I guarantee that very few people in security have done anything close to that, right? So, you know, I, I feel that you, you should be able to hack your way into it. Uh, I, I'm not sure that the drop these days should be that significant. I, I feel that the field of cybersecurity is so big that you should be able to find an area that you are reason that you can hit the ground running with your skill set that you have because there's already a premium like you said 40k is, is quite a high salary for a, a senior teacher or a head of school but in cybersecurity it doesn't doesn't get you very far right yeah and then you, you uh, the thing is with with cybersecurity you can still be doing your day job and then dedicating time for a certain amount of period to, to, to get those technical skills in whatever you're interested in. So that when it does come time to transition, you can say, well, yeah, I've got all of these skills from my normal job. And then I've also got, you know, these technical skills. I may not be as advanced as someone who's doing it full time, but I've got something that I can build off of. 
And then again, if you work for any mid-sized company, go and help your security team. I'm, I'm sure they'll love the help, right? And it's a great way to get already security experience. There you go. Cool, right? This is a great session. Thanks a lot for everybody for joining in. I hope we move the needle a, a bit more on this topic and I'll see you in other sessions. Thank you. Thank Ciao, you. Bellows. Bye.